This is New Day Weekend with Victor Blackwell and Christy Paul. Well, after a bizarre press conference that saw Virginia Governor Ralph Northam apologize and try to explain himself, there are now more people calling for his resignation than there were the day before. Yeah, at first, Northam admitted being in that racist 1984 yearbook photo. Now he's denying it, but it was the way he chose to deny it that has a lot of people going, what's happening? Take a look at this. When I was confronted with the images yesterday, I was appalled that they appeared on my page, but I believe then and now that I am not either of the people in that photo. I am not and will not excuse the content of the photo. It was offensive, racist, and despicable. Why, why did I dress up? Yes, I, I didn't realize at the time that it was as, as offensive as, as I have since learned. And uh, knowing that, what I know now, I wouldn't have done it. But at the time, I, I didn't realize that. I did participate in a dance contest in San Antonio in which I darkened my face as part of a Michael Jackson costume. I had uh, the shoes, I had a, a glove, uh, and I used just a little bit of shoe polish to put under my or on my cheeks. And the reason I used a very little bit is because I don't know if anybody's ever tried that, but you cannot get shoe polish off. Are you still able to move on? Uh, inappropriate circumstances. My wife says inappropriate circumstances. I was the president of the VMI Honor Court. Our code there is a cadet shall not lie, cheat, steal, or tolerate those do. Uh, that's the most meaningful thing to me in my life. Uh, I tell the truth. I'm telling the truth today. Now, after that, more elected officials went on the record and they urged him to resign. Yes, Senators Mark Warner, Tim Kaine had been privately encouraging Northam to step down. A Democrat with knowledge of those talks tells CNN after that press conference, their patience was gone. Let's go live now to CNN politics reporter Dan America in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, Dan, there are a lot of people questioning not only the governor, but those advising the governor who said that this would be a good idea. This could keep you in office. It seems to have caused more damage. Yeah, it was pretty clear shortly after that press conference that while Ralph Northam went into that room hoping to shore up support and possibly stem the calls for his resignation, he failed spectacularly. He did not get what he needed most, which is more support, reaffirmation of support from some top names in Virginia politics on the Democratic side. The real earth-shaking statement came when Senator Tim Kaine and Senator Mark Warner, it's worth noting both former governors of the Commonwealth of Virginia, as well as Bobby Scott, a representative from Virginia, issued a statement saying that they watched the press conference and could no longer support Governor Ralph Northam. I want to read to you exactly what they said. They said, after we watched his press conference today, we called Governor Northam to tell him that we no longer believe he can effectively serve as governor of Virginia and that he must resign. That was earth shattering to many people here, but it was followed up by a statement from Attorney General Mark Herring and the first African-American governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, Doug Wilder, both saying that they no longer supported the governor after they released somewhat tepid statements on Friday and Saturday where they said it was up to him. They didn't call outright for his resignation. That was very significant because it basically said that this man who didn't have a party, you have to remember that on Friday and Saturday, he lost the support of both sides of the Democratic caucus here at the State House. He also lost the support of his, of his party, the Democratic Party of Virginia, said that they no longer supported him and wanted him to resign. This man without a party went into this press conference that was frankly quite bizarre. He, he talked about how he had blackened his face for a Michael Jackson costume in an attempt to defend himself from a photo he said he didn't appear in. It's also worth noting that he kind of flip-flopped. On Friday, he said that the photo didn't, what was him, that he admitted to being in the photo. And then on Saturday, he is saying the exact opposite. It has rankled a lot of people here who, who said that he hurt himself more in that press conference because he raised credibility questions. And going forward, it really is difficult for many people here to see how, what his path forward is, Victor and Christy. All right. Dan Merica, appreciate the update. Thank you so much.
All right, with us now, CNN political commentator Maria Cardona, Democratic strategist, and CNN political analyst Julian Zelizer, historian and professor at Princeton University. Welcome back. I mean, this has become uh, even more bizarre after that news conference, Maria. First, let's yeah. just set um, what the governor said on Friday versus what he said yesterday. Yesterday, he apologized for the picture being on his page. But this is what he said on Friday. I am deeply sorry for the decision I made to appear as I did in this photo. Why would any politician or any advisor to a politician, to a principal, allow them to admit to being in a potentially career-ending photo if there's any deniability? It just doesn't make sense. It makes absolutely zero sense, Victor, which is why as I think everybody has been stating since the press conference, that press conference was deadly for him. And in my book, look, what he said on Friday completely, I think, underscores the fact that either he was in that photo or he understands that there were instances when he did this, because if not, his reaction would have been one of utter outrage and incredulity that a photo like that would have either ended up on his face on on his uh, yearbook page or that anybody would ever think that he would be capable of that. But and you that wouldn't have to call around to friends to check. You wouldn't have <laughs> exactly. to call your old friends to say, did I appear in blackface? Do you remember me in a KKK costume? Because that's I exactly, don't recall. That's exactly right, Victor. That is why this completely is incredible. His press conference underscored that. Mm. And I am so glad that as painful as this is for Democrats and for people in Virginia who put their hope and their faith in Ralph Northam, mm. he has got to step aside. And look, this doesn't mean that he can't be forgiven. This doesn't mean that he can't be redeemed. He can be forgiven, yeah. but that doesn't mean that he is con continues to be capable of leading Virginia. Yeah. He is not capable of doing that and he needs to step aside. Let me get Julian in here because you have an op-ed up on CNN.com that reminds us, you know, this was not in the 1940s or 50s, right? What he said yesterday was that uh, he attributed his uh, not being, if you believe that, that uh, denial from the governor, <laughs> that he wasn't in blackface in Virginia, but he was in blackface in Texas at this dance competition. He attributes it to the place and time where I grew up. Al Jolson wasn't still singing Mammy on television. He was impersonating Michael Jackson in the mid 80s. Give us a reminder, Julian, of where the world was in 84. Yeah, look, uh, by the 1980s, <clears throat> civil rights is, is very much alive and well. The year before, the nation and Virginia had gone through a debate over making Martin Luther King's birthday a national holiday. <clears throat> Virginia actually resisted. Uh, and the idea both of uh, using blackface was, was not widely accepted. It was controversial when it came up in the 80s. And certainly having a photo of that and someone in a KKK costume, whoever it is, whoever's in the photo, to have that on a yearbook page of yours with your name uh, was not the normal thing to do in the 1980s and 1984. So this was controversial then. And circa 2019, as the governor of a state that just went through the trauma of Charlottesville, mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, the traumatic thing today. So, so there is no real excuse for having that photo on your page, whoever you are. And the photo has now been confirmed. Uh, and so that's what makes it difficult to support him at this point. So, Maria, the governor says he's not going to leave. At least he says if he can still continue to do good for the people of the <laughs> Commonwealth. What are the options for, let's talk about the state Democrats, not so much for those on the outside, the presidential mm -hmm. candidates, those former candidates and, sure. and senators, but, but a state legislature with Democrats in the minority in, in Virginia, what are their options to force this governor because they want him out? Well, I think that what is going to happen is that the pressure is going to be so great, Victor, that, that he, Ralph Northam is just not going to be able to sustain it. And if he is going to at least live up to what he himself calls himself in terms of having honor, having integrity, 
and being somebody that that has values he is going to have to step aside. It's ironic that he said in his press conference yesterday that one of the reasons why he wants to stay as governor of Virginia is to be able to lead the conversation about race, to be able to be the one to lead the healing. Well, I'm sorry, governor, but you are the one who appears in this photo of blackface, or at least have admitted to appearing in blackface. Mm. You cannot be the one to be able to lead this conversation with credibility. You cannot be the one to be able to lead Virginia to healing in your current position as governor. Yeah. If he wants to try to do that, Victor, that could be a great way for him to redeem himself. And we all know that America loves a story of redemption. But, but you don't America, have to do that in the that's state That's right, yeah. exactly. And especially, Victor, it is especially unsustainable when the person who is waiting in the background to take the leadership position of Virginia is a young, dynamic African-American man named uh, Justin Fairfax, yeah. whose who's, uh, ancestors were actually slaves in Virginia. Well, that, we'll see, to me, is the picture we'll of see if, redemption. If that pressure continues to come from the state legislature and, and Democrats and maybe it some will. Republicans. Maria Cardona, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Julian, you, stick Victor. around because we're going to talk about the State of the Union. Uh, and speaking of State of the Union, the show, not the speech. Former Governor Terry McAuliffe and Senator Richard Shelby are on State of the Union with Jake Tapper later this morning at 9 a.m. Eastern right here on CNN. Because President Trump is set to address the nation Tuesday in mm -hmm. his State, State of, of the, the Union, Union, telling reporters there's going to be a, and I'm quoting here, a big announcement. What we're learning about what is to come. Stay close. Plus, the countdown to Super Bowl 53, down to just a few hours now. Andy Scholes is getting ready for the biggest day in sports. Andy. Yeah, it's finally here, guys. Will Tom Brady be able to win a sixth Super Bowl later today? Or will Aaron Donald and the Rams pull off the upset? We're going to have celebrity predictions for you coming up. This is CNN Breaking News. President Trump is scheduled to address the nation on Tuesday. The State of the Union address is about 10 days out from a potential second government shutdown. In the meantime, lawmakers are working to deliver the president a spending bill that would avoid another shutdown. Now, Friday, President Trump fueled speculation that he may bypass Congress altogether, possibly declaring this national emergency to secure funding for his border wall. CNN White House reporter Sarah Westwood joins us now. So, uh, Sarah, what are you learning about uh, the, the State of the Union? Any details? Well, good morning, uh, Victor and Christy. And what we're learning about the State of the Union is that the White House expects President Trump to try to project a tone of optimism. They use words like bipartisanship, optimism, unity to describe this speech. The theme of it is called choosing greatness. But of course, it's coming against the backdrop of those stalled budget negotiations on Capitol Hill, talks that the president has described as a waste of time. Democrats have been attacking President Trump uh, for leaving the door open to a second government shutdown on February 15th when the temporary spending bill runs dry. And President Trump is still hinting that he may have something to announce in the area of potentially pursuing federal funds through a different avenue during that State of the Union address. Listen to what he said on Friday. Mr. President, have you privately decided whether or not you will declare a national emergency? And just to clarify... Have I privately? You yes, know, you what's in my mind? What's in your mind? Well, I'm certainly thinking about it. You're thinking that have I, I think there's a good chance that we'll have to do that. Are you saying that you will, that we should be prepared for you to announce at the State of the Union what you are going to Well, I'm saying listen closely to the State of the Union. I think you'll find it very exciting. Now, keep in mind that President Trump ex expressed reluctance to declare a national emergency to try to get wall money that way during the last shutdown. But as the talks have continued to deadlock during this round of negotiations, Trump is increasingly suggesting that he fully expects to declare a national emergency. And we do expect President Trump to invite guests to the State of the Union that complement the topics that he's expected to talk about. The White House says that includes trade, immigration, the economy, national security. The White House says they'll unveil the identities of those 
those guests tomorrow afternoon, so we'll be looking to that. But we are getting a sense of how some lawmakers plan to observe the tradition of bringing guests who symbolize issues that they care about. For example, Democratic Senator Kamala Harris, she's bringing an air traffic controller who was affected by this latest shutdown. Republican Senator John Cornyn bringing a, a border patrol sector chief. He's someone who's championed border security. Democratic uh, Congressman Eric Swalwell bringing a survivor of a school shooting. So all of these people uh, we will expect to see bringing their issues into the State of the Union as well on Tuesday. Victor and Christy. Sarah Westwood for us there in West Palm Beach near the President's Resort. Thanks so much. Back with us, CNN political analyst Julian Zelizer, and now Siraj Hashmi, a commentary writer and editor for the Washington Examiner. Gentlemen, good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. So we just heard Sarah talk about what we can expect at State of the Union. At the end of the day, I know he's going to have this optimistic tone. Uh, it's titled Choosing Greatness. Siraj, I want to know what you're watching for, because there is no doubt going to be an awful lot of tension in that room. Absolutely. And, you know, there's about a 99 percent chance that if Virginia Governor Ralph Northam doesn't resign by the time Trump delivers the State of the Union, uh, Donald Trump is going to go hit Democrats and criticize them for condemning Northam after the racist yearbook photo, but not saying anything or having at least met the outrage standards in terms of calling for his resignation after his comments that seem to suggest infanticide. And it might spark a new debate about where the Democratic Party and what values they hold most dear. But of course, we're going to look at border security. If there's going to be anything exciting about this that may produce a moment of, of bipartisanship, it would be possibly President Trump turning towards House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, maybe giving her a wink or a smile, fist bump or even a hug. Well, that would be interesting if we saw that. <laughs> I, and speaking of uh, the speaker, Julian, I want to read something from your op-ed with CNN. You wrote this. Without question, Pelosi is the most lethal political threat to this presidency. The House has the power to issue subpoenas, launch investigations and hearings, and initiate impeachment proceedings. Trump's fate may very well be shaped by her decisions. Historically, there have been presidents who have been at odds with speakers when giving the State of the Union. How do you think this one's going to be different? It won't be different. This reminds me a little of when Nixon spoke and Carl Albert, who was a Democrat, was the Speaker of the House in 1974, the year everything fell apart. The tension will be uh, palpable in the room. Speaker Pelosi has little love for the president. And whatever the president says, I, I think he is frustrated how he was uh, faced down because of this fight over the government shutdown. And so there might be rhetoric. I doubt there'll be a fist pump. Maybe there will be. Uh, but the reality is this is the confrontation that will shape uh, the next year, not only on the investigation issues, but also on issues such as the budget and such as the wall. Okay, so Siraj, um, what's interesting is we heard Sarah talk about some of the people that will be guests uh, of some of the congressmen and women who are going. New Jersey Representative Bonnie Watson Coleman is bringing Victoria, Victorina Morales, she's an undocumented worker who was recently fired from the Trump National Golf Course. We also have Congresswoman, Congressman uh, from California, Jimmy Gomez. He tweeted this on Friday. Sandra Diaz, a formerly undocumented worker who was hired by the Trump Golf Course, will be my guest at the State of the Union. Trump calls immigrants murderers and rapists, but he wants them to clean his hotels and golf courses. Hypocrisy at its worst. So when President talks about immigration, what is the power or lack of power uh, of their presence in that room? Well, it's interesting because President Trump, while he was still just a businessman, he definitely relied on undocumented workers uh, to basically be employees of his organization. And you're going to see, obviously, the tonal shift from Trump going hard after immigrants and, and you, know, you know, championing the, the border wall. And he will definitely be called out by Democrats on this. And there's no question that, you know, he has had many times where he had many positions that were different from where he is right now. I mean, you know, looking back at even towards, you know, 1999, he was very much pro-choice and now he's pro-life. You know, the same thing can be said about him with respect to immigration. Um, and, and obviously this is one of those things that he's just going to have to be strong on in terms of being forceful in his language that the, the United States needs a border wall. And of course, there are many good immigrants in this country, whether they're, they came in the country legally or illegally, and that 
that we just need to reform our immigration system. Julian, I mean, immigration is going to be one of his most bruising battles, no doubt about it. Has there ever been a State of the Union that actually turned the corner, made progress for the president? Not really. Uh, the example that comes to mind is 2002 when President George W. Bush laid out the axis of evil, uh, which were nations like Iraq, who he argued were also part of the war on terrorism. It was forceful in that it helped build political support for uh, launching troops, but obviously this was a disastrous war and it ended up helping to drag down his presidency and the reputation of the GOP. So you can actually move people every now and then, but in, but in the wrong way. Uh, but overall, it's very hard for these speeches to move public opinion in a polarized era. Very few people in the electorate are going to be persuaded by a speech to all of a sudden say, oh, I changed my mind on an issue. What's more likely is this is a way to try to rally Republicans uh, behind the president. But I still think that's a hard sell given how much of the public, including more and more Republicans, don't believe this wall is needed, right. useful, or worth shutting down the government again for. Julian Zelizer, Siraz Hashmi, we appreciate both of you being here, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Christy. And join us for President Trump's State of the Union Address to the Nation. Special live coverage starts Tuesday night at 8 Eastern right here on CNN. Stay with us. We're talking about no heat, no power, no hot water. Not just for a day, but for days. These are the complaints of more than a thousand inmates and workers at a federal prison in Brooklyn, New York. The community, you see them all there coming out. They are outraged. We have an update for you. And youth versus experience at the Super Bowl. Our Andy Scholes will look ahead to the big game. All right, are you up early making your food? Getting all your drinks in order, all lined up, everybody Layers ready? One and two of the seven layer dip <laughs> in already. Working on that third layer. Oh, Super Bowl 53, of course. Now we're just hours away, we can finally say it. Patriots and Rams set to face off here in Atlanta. Andy Schultz has more from outside Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Interesting matchup, Andy. Yeah, you guys make me hungry talking about all that dip. <laughs> I can't wait to get into something later today. But you know what? The time for talking is over. It's finally time to settle this on the field. Tom Brady and the Patriots trying to win their sixth Super Bowl. That would tie them with the Steelers for the most all time. And many believe... The only way the Rams have a shot at winning this game is if they can get to Brady. He hasn't been sacked all playoffs long. But the Rams, they have the 2018 Defensive Player of the Year, Aaron Donald. He was given the award last night for the second year in a row. And Donald is as unstoppable as they come. I mean, he's a freak. Just disruptive, man. Relentless. Best defensive player in the league. If I had to think of one word, I would say dominant. Uh, he, he's probably he, he's the best player that I play with. When you got a guy six six one that can bench five hundred pounds, you know, lift a, lift a truck, you know, it's 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 nobody can defeat him. If he go full out in practice, then we probably won't get a lot done. You know what I'm saying? So even though he looks blocked, he's really not blocked. And you know, next thing you know, he's off a guy. You know, getting to the quarterback, causing havoc. All right, so we'll see if Donald has a big game. The NFL's MVP also handed out last night. No surprise, the Chiefs' Patrick Mahomes running away with the award. Mahomes, just the second player ever to throw for 5,000 yards and 50 touchdowns in a season. And at 23 years old, Mahomes is the second youngest player to ever win the NFL's MVP award. Now, a big part of Super Bowl week, always all the parties around. All the parties around town. Well, yesterday, I went to the Fanatic celebration. Cardi B was the headliner. And check out Patriots owner Robert Kraft. He jumps out there on stage and starts dancing with Cardi B during her performance. The 77-year-old still has some moves. And while I was at the party, I talked to a bunch of athletes and celebrities to get their predictions for today's game. I think you'll kind of know early how it's going to be. We're making a house call. We have to collect a copay. But this one time, I'll give away free recommendation. I'm going with the pass to cover the spread. Hey, I'm going for the Rams. That's it. That's all I can say. Tom Brady is so good. You know what? I wouldn't mind seeing him win another championship. Oh, no. I'm rocking for the Patriots to blow the Rams out. I see it being close one way or the other. That's all I know. And don't bet against Brady. <laughs> prediction. Eagles will win 37 to 16. Eagles, that's my prediction. That's last year. Eagles, 37 to 16. That's my prediction. Hey, you guys, Kevin Hart, big Eagles fan, uh, always the comedian. So he has the Eagles winning this Super Bowl, even though they are not in it. But, uh, you know, a lot of people picking Patriots, guys. 
Uh, so it wouldn't surprise me if the Rams shock everyone like the Eagles did last year, and it ends up being the Rams winning tonight. All right, we will see Andy Scholes. Thanks so much. Thank you, Andy. So we are now almost 12 hours into a standoff between police in Ohio and a suspect, uh, a suspect who shot and killed Ohio Sheriff's deputy. Another is recovering, uh, and the suspect has barricaded himself now in an apartment. Authorities in Claremont County, Ohio there, this is near Cincinnati, say the deputies were doing a welfare check when they were shot. Minutes earlier, a man did call 911 saying there were people in his apartment who wouldn't leave and that he had weapons in that home. Uh, but again, one officer has died, another is recovering, and that standoff is still going on. It started last night at about 7 p.m., so almost 12 hours in. Pope Francis is beginning a historic visit to the Middle East today. Coming up, why this three-day trip to the United Arab Emirates is so very important. 